Alright guys, um, this is going to be the second week of phase two. We're going to do the um, videos for the week of April 6th through the 10th. And my office hours, as you can see, are from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. every single day. And I'm looking to schedule a Google Classroom, it's like a weather person here, for Monday, um, April 13th, trying to not get myself blinded by all, all these lights. So keep an eye on Google Classroom for that. It's been about a month since we've seen each other, hoping we can get a little interaction going. So sit back with your families and enjoy a little bit of a recap of Guadalcanal. Moving onward, God, I cannot move here. This is driving me crazy. Um, moving in towards the Battle of New Britain, Rabul, and eventually Operations Cartwheel and the Bloody Battle of Tarawa. So where we just finished, we were down here in Guadalcanal. And General Douglas MacArthur, after the long, bloody battle of Guadalcanal, wants to move this direction. He wants to move to the north and the east around New Guinea. And the next hotspots are going to be New Britain, Rabul, and the island of Bougainvillea over here. The Japanese, Hazo Adachi, the general, has consolidated coming back here, trying to build up supplies and reinforcements to retake especially the key island of Rabul. Midway, Guadalcanal have happened, and the Japanese are trying desperately to cling to their empire. I know it's a little blurry. We're in my garage doing the best that, that we can do. And this is going to be an allied effort. It's going to be American forces, Australian, New Zealand. Everyone is going to pitch in in these next bloody battles, eventually culminating in the Battle of Bismarck Sea, and the bloody Battle of Tarawa. So this is going to be known as Operation Cartwheel. So to put that into context, oops, i got to stay in my half-hour time zone here, is we have Guadalcanal. And Guadalcanal is reaching its feverish climax in November of 1942. And to put that into perspective, it's the same time as the Battle of Stalingrad over in the European North African theater. And think of that Stalingrad was key because if you envision Evan in the back corner back there as Stalingrad and we're stretching Hitler's rubber band all the way to where Seth Morton is, it's two polar opposites of the classroom. That was the key for Stalingrad so Operation Torch can be um, successful. We have Patton coming from one area. We've got Montgomery coming from the other area, slowly pushing everyone out towards the Battle of Sicily you heard about last week. Well, at the same time as all that is going on, we have our second theater over in the Pacific. And Guadalcanal was the testing ground for American troops, as well as how Japan was going to be able to defend herself. That is the big key right there. And when Guadalcanal is over and we enter this next phase, the United States Navy finally stops the Tokyo Express. The Tokyo Express was the sea lane where the Japanese had free reign both in the air and in the Navy to bring reinforcements. And there was a massive ship-to-ship -ship engagement at the end of um, December. But as the Japanese sunk more of our ships, it was the United States air forces from the different islands and our aircraft carriers that were able to turn the tide of the battle. Now, um, we had already talked about how Guadalcanal was abandoned by the United States Navy early on. Now that's the Japanese term to first give it up. Their first massive land area where they've been pushed out of. And this is where the Marines have to undergo this very difficult mindset, and the Army soldiers who come in later is, you know, due to the Japanese propensity of booby-trapping themselves and blowing themselves up to kill Navy corpsmen and medical personnel, if you weren't sure, you had what's called kill it twice, bayonet it or shoot it, to make sure that wounded Japanese soldier or Marine is actually dead. It's a very disturbing, difficult thing mentally to do. And so out of the, just the viciousness and violence of Guadalcanal, we decide on an island hopping strategy. It's not going to be possible to fight you know, every Marine, every soldier that the Japanese have in all of these islands back to its homeland. 
So we're going to jump and leapfrog over them three, four hundred miles ahead, knowing that anybody trapped in between is going to be cut off. We're not going to waste the manpower to capture Ever Island. We're going to go as far as we can and keep leapfrogging. So the First Marine Division is going to be replaced by the United States 25 Inf Infantry Division. They've got brand new weapons coming online. The M1 Garand, uh, you know, the BAR. Flamethrowers are going to be used. Top of the line, you know, Browning 30 caliber machine guns, air cold machine guns, not the old World War I crap that the Marines had been fighting with. And when it's done on Guadalcanal, the Japanese are going to lose about 20,000 men. They're going to lose a little over 800, about 860 aircraft and 15 ships. And this is difficult for Japan. It's very important because those are things they cannot replace. They don't have the industrial raw materials to rebuild them. And as their stockpile is dwindling, America's is increasing. Remember, December 6th, 1941, it took the United States about three months to build a battleship like the Arizona or the North Carolina. Pretty soon we're going to crank one out every 30 days. So we're getting more and more and more and more and more. Well, the Japanese are getting less and less and less. And here is where both American and Japanese propaganda comes into play, where we learn that the Japanese are not just little easy pushovers, and the Japanese learn that Americans aren't afraid of a fight, we're not soft, we're not afraid of hand-to-hand -hand combat, and we're not afraid to operate in the dark. So many different things are beginning to come into play at this point. And now this takes us to Operation Cartwheel. And this is the, just the, the nasty battles of Port Moresby, which the Japanese badly want, Rabul, New Britain, and Bougainvillea. And General Douglas MacArthur plans this operation to show the growing strength of the United States, the power that I just talked about that we are getting better. All right? United States, 50,000 Australians are going to go into the Gilbert and the Marshall Islands, that next chain moving up diagonally from south to northeast that I showed you on that blurry map. Japanese want the, to hang on to these islands. We're going to go in and get them. And the Japanese had begun to build secret air bases. The idea is to bomb that area, disrupt shipping and military operations. So it is United States General Kenny's and his 5th Air Force from our own secret bases, and again, the Japanese are still trying to figure out where Shangri-La is after the Doolittle raid, that we're going to use to devastate and attack the Japanese forces. They're not going to know what happens. And as um, Adachi is bringing in reinforcements, there's a battle of Bismarck Sea. It's this kind of not very well-known um, naval battle, where we knew the Japanese convoy was coming in, and we sprung a trap on them. The Japanese lose 11 to 15 more vessels, and Adachi and about 1,000 of his guys are able to get out of there alive. So um, it's a devastating blow for the, the, the Japanese. They're slowly seeing their circle of power dwindle. So now, um, as Kenny's does that, we land on the island of New Britain in mid-December. And what we are trying to do was cut off the dachi from any more support from the Japanese Navy. And so as the American air and ground forces are slowly at first just inexorably pushing forward, um, we shove Adachi deep into the mountains. He keeps falling back farther and farther and farther northward till he gets into this island fortress. It's so dense that it takes until 1945 for the end of the war for him to surrender. Now his actions in the early part of the war were so heinous, he is tried in Australia and convicted of war crimes. Um, rather than being executed like the good samurai, he comes from a very low-ranking samurai family, he commits seppuku with a um, paring knife. But what Cartwheel does is it shifts the balance of power in favor of the Allies. There was the dramatic victory at Midway. 
then the victory at Guadalcanal, long and bloody and tough as it was, and now these areas. And so the Marines had come in at a high point. After Guadalcanal, many of the 1st Marine Division went to Australia, where they went down to Melbourne, and they had a really good time drinking beer, hanging out with um, the Australian um, population. If you've seen episode three of the Pacific, this is when they are in Australia. And now they go back into this area. And New Britain and Bougainvillea were just nasty. Um, the, the thing that begins to eat at the guys is this is the monsoon South Pacific rainy season when the winds bring the rains. It was how to stay mentally fit when you're constantly soaking wet every day. Then you'll see some of the guys begin to develop a medical condition called aneurysis where you're so wet all the time psychologically you don't realize it but you pee yourself and it happens to Lecky, one of the guys from the miniseries that we were watching. So as the guys get done with Operation Cartwheel they think they're going to go back to Australia and they don't. They go to another barren little South Pacific island that's overwritten with crawling crabs and you know rats and just you know nastiness, rotten coconuts where they've got to build their own barracks and maintain their training and their discipline. So while it's a victory, Bougainvillea and New Britain are just nasty for the American Marines. But when it's all said and done, you see the Japanese have had an empire in the Pacific for roughly two years. About the length of time that Prince Konye predicted when he was talking to Hideki Tojo. We can do this for maybe one to two months in perfect equanimity. And other than that, we are slowly going to lose. And that's exactly what we find out. But it is the long, long supply route. The tropical conditions that make fighting tough on both sides. And what shocks the United States is the Japanese complete disregard for the lives of their soldiers and Marines. They just keep throwing men into the meat grinder. And this fighting war is nasty anywhere, but the fighting in the Pacific is more vicious and brutal and like primal nasty than anything we're going to see in North Africa, uh, in Italy and in northwestern um, Europe. So, um, the bloody battle of Tarawa. And this is something uh, we're going to talk about. It's, um, you know, there's no, you know, John Wayne movie made about it. And Tarawa is going to go on for a, a, a long time. It is, again, it's just like the Civil War. All this is only going to take a couple days or a couple weeks, and if we do this, we're going to have an easy victory. Tarawa is going to start in November of 1943 and end in February of 1944. So we're just going to you know, go on a very long time, kind of simultaneous with the invasion of Italy, which we're going to talk about tomorrow and maybe Wednesday. And it starts right as America begins its island hopping campaign. And put it into action is Admiral Mark Michener. And he begins the second phase of a two-pronged assault in the Pacific. One going, you know, kind of widening out, you know, going north and then curving east. And the other one going south and then curving in. Think of like a, like, like a meat prong. And this is going to be a stepping stone. And what we need it for is to capture air bases in the Marianas Islands for a brand new long-range bomber, the B-29, that is going to see devastating effects on the home islands of Japan shortly. And Tarawa is a little atoll. It's just a little tiny spit of land in the middle of nowhere, made up of two basic island groups, Macon and Betio. And if you've ever seen the Tom Hanks movie, Castaway, this is kind of like the little island that he is trapped on, surrounded by those concentric rings of coral reefs. There will be eight of them that the Marines have to fight through. And it's one of the nastiest bloody battles in the United States history as the Japanese begin a new phase in their defense. The Japanese 
are going to have about 4,500 Marines dug in with 500 pillboxes. And a pillbox is a concrete structure that's three stories tall. The famous ones are on Normandy Beach in, in Germany. And they go down subterranean. So two of the three levels are underground. Each one can hold two or three, um, 20 to 30 guys. They have got machine gun ports. They're camouflaged. They've got submarine, um, you know, like you know, doors, you know, to close and seal off and exit. And they're connected to a tunnel that runs underground in the coral system. Think of like an anthill moving back and forth across the island of Taro. It's a very intricate defensive trade um, network. Here is Mark Mishner, and over here is you know, the, one of the atolls of Taro. You can see it's long and it's thin. It's not very wide. So we're going to need this for our B-29s. And if you can see, kind of like a carpenter's speed square, it's an old fort. We've got rounded defensive parapets, machine guns, artillery, sighted all the way around the island. And then underneath it will be the tunnel. So you could go from one end of the island to the other underground. Here is a little airfield that the Japanese were building. So this is the Japanese obstacles. You can see uh, it's different than Guadalcanal where the Marines walked ashore. Now they've got fixed defensive. And we've got to come out of the water on an amphibious assault on Higgins boats or amphibious tractors and assault a beach that's heavily defended. You think of going back to you know, Adolf Hitler trying to attack Battle of Britain, you know, Hitler could not even roll up on the beaches that were undefended. Remember, the British had nothing to defend themselves with after Dunkirk. Only two guys have ever successfully invaded, you know, England. Julius Caesar and William the Conqueror, kind of in the upper pantheon of the Jedi Tower of military leaders. Those beaches weren't defended. These ones are. And you can see our Marines are just stuck right here. They've just barely gotten off the beach and the Japanese are ready for them. So it's just a nasty, nasty, violent battle. And so Admiral Nimitz is going to have to send about 100,000 soldiers, 200 ships, and 6,000 vehicles to take these tiny little islands. And we're doing it Again, to get our air power to closer to Japan to bring the war directly to them. We've only got about 10 minutes left. We may have to pick this up um, tomorrow. Well, <clears throat> uh, in the first phase, going after the first island, it takes the Japanese, the Americans, Marines, excuse me, about three days of nasty fighting. Um, they're going to conduct a beach landing right into the nasty, the, the strength and the teeth of prepared Japanese resistance. Much different, much more difficult than George Patton faced in the Gulf of Gela invading Sicily. And so the Japanese understand what Nimitz and MacArthur's island hopping philosophy is. And they say, okay, if this is what you're going to do, if you're going to skip over everything, we're going to try and fortify every island we have and you are going to pay dearly in which to take it. Now the assault on the main target is supposed to begin with an aerial bombardment for four days, followed by a massive naval barrage as soldiers get out of the, the holds and their amphibious tractors and drive towards the beaches. So the Navy is firing over their heads, preparing their landing ground. And this is General Howland Mad Smith. And he is going to say later on that the only defense that the Marines had were the khaki shirts that they wore. They had literally no defense, no armor, no protection for what they ran into. And this is going to be an amphibious tractor. It's kind of like a, a bulldozer that has a boat propeller and can offload, you know, 15 to 20 Marines or a jeep with twin 50 caliber machine guns, you know, kind of protecting you as you go in. And so it's November, right before Thanksgiving, that the Marines are able to overwhelm the Macon Atoll. And, okay, this was done. 
we did it, hurrah, we used our aerial bombardment, we used our naval bombardment, and it works. And then everybody turns to the island of Beitio, the big one in the Tarawa Atoll. And then some genius, I'd like to find this guy, this moron, since things had gone so well on Macon, they said, hey, why don't we change it up? Why don't we juke out the Japanese? If we begin the aerial and naval bombardment, they won't, they'll know we're coming, since that's what we did over here on Macon. So let's change it up. Let's not bomb Batio. And this is like a, a Dr. Gershon's George McClellan move here. I'm sorry, Doc. Um, let's fake them out and send in guys with no pre-bombing whatsoever. And that's exactly what happened. And the problem is around the island was a concentric ring of coral reefs. All right? There were eight coral reefs surrounding the island. They were under the water and we didn't know how thick they were. There were only a few tiny openings where our amphibious vehicles could get through. And in those gaps, there were anti-ship and anti-personnel mines. We figured our amphibious tractors could grind through the coral or float over top of them. Once you get through the natural defenses, there are the beaches, covered and strung in barbed wire. There are hidden booby traps, there are machine gun nests, there are pillow boxes camouflaged beautifully in the South Pacific tropical jungle. Japanese had conscripted slave laborers that made these intricate defenses plus the concrete pillboxes along with the giant tunnels underneath the ground. And here the Marines are going to face Japanese Admiral Shibasaki. And Shibasaki is going to command Imperial Na Naval Guards, excuse me. These are some of the very best troops the Japanese have left, right? These are A-gamers, right? This is the varsity team. These guys are awesome. And the United States Marines thought surprise was the best way to overcome this. That moron, well, we're not going to destroy their defenses. We're not going to blow them up. We're going to do this the old-fashioned way. We're just going to go straight on in. And the Marines are down in their holds, and the engines fire up, and the doors, the, the seashell doors haven't opened up, clamshell doors. So you're standing there, you're terrified. For many of you are a replacement, um, this is your first battle. If you're a veteran, maybe you were in Guadalcanal. And then you got to go to Melbourne, and you found yourself in New Britain. And then you got to go back to Pavuvu, that tiny little crappy island where you had to build your own shelter with, like, you know, sea crabs and rats running everywhere. You're sitting there, you're tired, maybe you're scared, all the exhaust fumes build up in the hold. Then you go down the ramp and you're sloshing around in the ocean. You know, some guys are throwing up, some are trembling, and some just have this grim, gritty, determination. And so in goes the 2nd Marine Division, led by Jubal Smith. And as they're heading in, their tractors, they realize there aren't enough for the entire invasion fleet to go in at once. So they're going to have to drop Marines off, go back to the ships, reload, and come back in. This is one of many times this happens in World War II. And as they start in, the Marines get trapped on those coral reefs. The amphibious tractors can't move. And this allows Japanese artillery to you know, target them. You're not moving your stationary target to command. Amtraks are just blowing up. So soldiers have to jump out and wade through the water. Now, if you were little like me, and when you were little, if you were like me, um, when I was a young lad, the Green Army man that had his rifle up, up in the air, all right? I'm like, what is this guy doing? He was always the first guy when I played Army men to get taken out. And then I learned why he had his rifle above his head. This was an homage to the 2nd Marine Division as the soldiers have to jump out and put their rifle above their head as they waded through chest-deep water. Some of these guys had to go almost a half a mile, you know, out to sea, walking through the water with machine gun bullets, with artillery, keeping their ammunition and their rifle up in the air so they could use it 
once they got to land. It's an incredible bit of marine tenacity and bravery. So next time you play with your army men, give this guy a break. It resembles the marines' actions on, in the great battle of Tarawa. So, <clears throat> um, Howlin' Mad Smith, all right, again says, my marines wore their khaki shirts as their armor that day. And the Japanese just open up with everything they have, the Naboo machine gun, artillery, you name it, they had it. And as the artillery began to fire, the Navy once again had to back off, leaving these Marines once again to fend for themselves, just like after the Battle of Iron Bottom Sound in Guadalcanal. And we're going to end um, probably with this slide um, for the day. Private Robert Radar is going to say, as he gets ready to hit the beach, there was nothing but machine guns and mortar fire. It was splashing all around you. These Amtraks, they were just as if not more dangerous than jumping in the water with water up to your neck, you know, like taking a step and jumping up, taking a step and jumping up to where you could come to ground and then crawling through that nasty coral getting, you know, cut up. Someone saw, shouted, let's go, and we went in. And when it's all said and done, about 20% of the Marines, one in every five, never make it out of the water on that beach assault. So that's a kind of a terrible cliffhanger to leave you guys on. Uh, but here is where we're going to stop for the day. Tomorrow, probably a shorter one as we will finish up the Battle of Tarawa and get ready for uh, the operation to invade Italy, which is just a, a mess. So also, uh, look online, try and do the Battle of Britain and Pearl Harbor a little review sheet. If you guys need that PowerPoint to answer the questions, let me know. This is kind of the way I see us doing class until we get back. The quizzes will just be review sheets, so if you watch these, you should be able to answer them pretty simply. And keep me apprised of what's going on if, you know, your other core classes, those should be your, your focus. Well, I do like to think of myself as important. We pretty much want all you guys to graduate. And like Hannah, you know, she's hoping that we actually have our graduation in, in the Dean Dome. So I hope to see you guys soon. Let me know if you guys need anything.